Good evening, good afternoon, possibly even good morning, depending where you're joining us from. Welcome to the November edition of the Khan in Scotland. And I'm delighted this evening to welcome Anna Madhill. Anna is a professor of psychology at Leeds University in the UK. And um, it feels really special tonight because unlike most of the guests we have in the Khan in Scotland, Anna is not a... Uh, a card carrying dyed in the wool Lacanian and yet, <laughs> yet, um, or a, a convert perhaps. Um, but this, I think, it speaks right to the spirit of the in Scotland that we have always strived to be not a, a, a Lacanian seminar for Lacanians, but we've tried to be open um, and um, welcome passes by um, in the the time before COVID and before we became an online seminar and we existed just in Edinburgh, we were very much a seminar um, aimed at the public and um, interested passers-by. So it's really, it really feels fantastic to have Anna come talk tonight, to have someone who's not um, a well-known, is not well-known as a Lacanian, um, to come and um look at Lacanian ideas then from a slightly different perspective and also the, the talk Anna's going to give tonight um, seeks to to try and look at how we can use Lacan um, in other ways to open Lacan, what use we can put Lacan to outside the clinic. Mm -hmm. And um, many of our speakers do that in certain ways, but they do that as, as practiced Lacanians within um, what we might say is a, a fairly firm tradition of using Lacan in, in, as a cultural um or an element of cultural theory. And I think what Anna's going to do tonight is something slightly different than that, an opening Lacan up for us. So I'm really excited to see, um, but to hear um, Anna talk and see how this goes. And as usual, what we'll do is we'll have 45 minutes of presentation um, followed by chat. And I hope then that opening up can carry on in the chat and we can, um, we can all engage with Anna and explore these ideas and really looking at Lacan as a, as a tool, and I think that's a really important question for us is, you know, beyond a way of doing psychoanalysis, many of us utilize the kind of as a, a tool in ways of understanding culture, society, what's going on in the world today. So I think there's a, there's a really vital question at the heart of this, of what use is the kind of, how can we use the kind? So um, without further ado, I'm gonna um, hand over to you, Anna. Um, thank you for doing this. Yeah, th th thank you for, for letting me present. Um, so the title is Bella Lugosi's Haunted Mirror, uh, spontaneously, Spontaneous Sense Making Around the Objet R. So um, my aim is on the next slide. Um, to the first one, to follow on from what um, what Callum has said, is um, well, th this is my first piece of writing um, using Lacanian concepts, and I did it partly to educate myself to actually because my they're quite dense concepts and um, devised in the clinic um, for clinical practice, but I wanted to kind of understand. Um, what does this look like in everyday life? And how how are these concepts spontaneously deployed? Obviously not using the terms, but can we interpret that you know, everyday situations, everyday meanings and understandings that, that people use? Can we kind of recuperate uh, Lacanian concepts? Because we, we ought to, this is telling us something fundamental about psychological um, uh, experience and, and psychological mechanisms. So um, I'm interested in narrators naive to psychoanalytic theory. And then this relates to my second aim, which is to explore if we can apply Lacanian theory to understand the experiences of the paranormal, because I really enjoy uh, TV around uh, you know, kind of the, the, the genre of paranormal experiences. And there's, there's a lot of it around, but I don't want to explain away these experiences, um, but I want to understand if we can um, see Lacanian concepts being used by these kind of naive narrators. What is what is my material? 
So I'm going to be analysing um, half of an episode of a six episode TV mini series called Deadly Possessions. This is hosted and produced by Zach Bagans, who also does ghost adventures, which I, I really enjoy. Um, and the mini series Deadly Possessions um, is where Zach interviews members of the public who are offering him haunted or cursed artifacts for his museum in Las Vegas. And it's a real museum that Zach owns called the Haunted Museum. So I analyzed a 27 minute clip from the first half, um, half of episode four. Um, and in it, um, Cindy and her daughter, Irene, relate a story about the murder of Cindy's Uncle Bob, uh, Frank Selectri, who lived in Bella Lugosi's old house. So uh, this is a, a documented murder of uh, Frank Selectri. Uh, and he lived in the actor Bella Lugosi's house. And... Um, the family are experiencing some traumatic disturbances around the mirror that we're told was in the bedroom during the murder and they want to donate this mirror to Zach's museum. So in my, my full analysis, um, I use quite a few different um, Lacanian and Freudian concepts, but in this one I'm just going to be focusing on the primal scene and the objet art. I'm not going to be looking at the mirror stage, the uncanny or the fundamental fantasy, but I, I look at that in my full analysis. So I'm going to um, say just a little bit more about what's been going on with um, Cindy Lee and, and, their, and the family. So, um, the act, so Cindy Lee relates a story about the murder of her uncle Bob. She tells us that her uncle worked with the actor Bela Lugosi and lived in his old house. In 1982, her husband, sorry, the uncle was murdered in the bedroom of this house. Unfortunately, the poor man was tortured with a screwdriver and then shot in the head. And very significantly for this analysis, the murder has never been solved. Cindy also tells us that the mirror from the bedroom now belongs to her family, although it's not entirely clear from the story, but the mirror seems to have been taken by Cindy's older daughter when she left home but then returned to Cindy's house and placed in her spare bedroom. Cindy and her younger daughter, Irene, recount aspects of the older daughter's experience with the mirror while she was living alone. This involved seeing a figure in the mirror, hands reaching out of the mirror and teeth biting her neck while she curled her hair in front of it. Traumatised, she returned to her mother's house. Irene, the younger daughter, also tells us about a bad dream she had when she was sleeping in a bedroom with a mirror in it. She dreamed of being attacked and she awoke with scratches on her body. Cindy wants to leave the mirror behind and Zach agrees to give it a good home in his museum. So throughout, Zach provides lots of relevant paranormal lore and he posits paranormal explanations for the disturbing experiences surrounding the mirror. And then he recruits three of his colleagues to do a scrying experiment, looking into the mirror in a, an isolation room in the basement of the, of, um, of, of the museum. And they have some experiences of hearing things and seeing things that shouldn't be there. And then Zach documents the flood in the museum um, the day after the experiment, so when the basement gets flooded, and he um, says that this mishap was to do with his um, now owning the mirror. So I'm going to be um, drawing on Freud's myth of the primal horde um, as a way into understanding why this mirror might be such a a, a, a libidinal, haunted, cursed object for, for Cindy. Um, and, and so why she may want to be, be rid of it. It's not any object, it's a cursed or haunted object for her and her family. So I'm going to assume um, 
as I go through the analysis, uh, a certain level of understanding of Lacanian concepts. And as Callum uh, said in the introduction, this, this audience um, is, is very experienced in Lacanian concepts. So I'm going to assume a, a certain knowledge while um, explicating um, to, you know, a, um, to a certain extent, so it's not completely obscure. Um, so Freud's, first of all, let's have a, a think about Freud's myth of the primal horde. Um, so this is a kind of um, origin myth for civilization that, that Freud posited. Um, and in it, he saw the original human tribe, the, the primal horde, as um, being uh, overseen by a, a kind of terrible father. And this terrible father of the primal horde in this myth um, is not subject to the law, but assumes sole sexual access to all the women. So as a result of this, according to the Freudian myth, um, this terrible primal father is murdered and eaten by the excluded band of brothers. And for Freud, this, is, this inaugurates uh, the law of sexual access to the women only of um, a certain category. So the law against incest, which is the foundations of civilization. So when we think about um, Cindy's family myth around the mirror, there's some really striking uh, similarities. So there's sexual elements insinuated by Cindy in, in relation to what happened in front of the mirror. Uh, for her, the murder of her uncle, she says, um, I think it was a close friend and whatever else went on who knows? So with this hearable sexual innuendo in this. And there's cannibalistic resonances uh, via the association with the vampire. So this happened in Bella Lugosi's house and Bella Lugosi's, um, one of his key roles was as Dracula, the vampire. So there's an association to, um, to, to this cannibalistic blood-sucking vampire. And Zach makes this very clear. He tells us Cindy Lee's uncle was killed inside Bella Lugosi's old house. So um, sexualization, cannibalism. And finally, Cindy says, it's speculated like a mob hit. And this is like the, is this possibly the band of brothers, um, Cindy, the mob hit. So I just thought there's striking resonances here, uh, Cindy's family myth. So my analysis suggests that the story of the murder of Cindy's uncle can be understood as a particularly horrific and archaic family primary primal scene involving the murder of the obscene father in the real. I just want to unpack what I mean by um, a primal scene. So for Freud, the primal scene is kind of like an um, origin myth of the individual. It's the, the fantasy of where they come from um, and places the, the individual in a sexualized kind of um, family dynamic where they are um, uh, have a sense of where they come from and they're, they're their sense of themselves as a sexualized being, but one that properly is placed within a civilized um, structure of non-incestual um, positioning in terms of, uh, of, of desire. And what is for Freud a myth is uh, interpreted as um, structural for Lacan. So Lacan makes this move from myth into structure. So this father of the primal horde, who is a mythological kind of mythic um, position for, for Freud, a mythic personage, um, is reinterpreted by Lacan as um, structural and particularly as the father in the real. So this is the father for whom there is no limit to his jouissance. He is not subject to the law. So properly, 
um, this father and the real should be held in check by symbolic structures, by so by the proper civilized social conventions. So we can see here that Cindy's family myth around the mirror um, is archaic, horrific, and brings up resi um, resonances of the obscene father in the real. This will become um, very important as we look at how the objects are, are manifested through this mirror. So we start this on the next slide. So the mirror is brought to Zach because it is having a disturbing effect, which includes the frightening image it sometimes reflects. And in fact, a central theme organizing the text is the potential of the mirror to manifest what is dreadful and what should not be there. And the con concept of the objet art provides a way of understanding what might be in play. So I, so I know this slide is really busy, but we're going to go through the different elements of this reasonably steadily. So um, it should become much more obvious and um, easy to understand as, as we go through. Um, so the objet art is... Um, what's often thought of as Lacan's major contribution to, to psychoanalysis. And it's based on kind of Klein's idea of the lost object. So the psychoanalytic object is associated with uh, inaugurating the drives uh, in the erogenous zones. Uh, is as each is associated with a tangible part object of the body. And then this intangible, um, properly lost Objet are. Um, and we're going to go through the four of them. The, the phallic object's not there, um, but we're going to go through the four main objects of the oral, the anal, the gaze, and the voice, which Lacan added. Uh, and just to, I'm not going to go into great detail on the, the theory of this because I think um, we can assume that, that this, this audience kind of understands. Um, but just to say that in Lacanian theory, in order for the child to be fully socialized, they must be subjected to castration and cut away from symbiosis with the mother. And this requires a sufficiently strong symbolic father or father function. And I think we can see what's going on with Cindy's family is that there's a very weak father function, that the law has actually let them down. The symbolic has let the family down. The murder of the uncle remains unsolved. I mean, we don't see any paternal uh, characters um, in, this, um, in, in this program. It's all the women. And castration is, is experienced unconsciously as losing parts of one's own body. For example, losing the mother's breast theorized to be experienced uh, by the infant as completing their mouth. So the object art is, um, can be experienced in each of the three Lacanian registers, the imaginary, the symbolic, and the real. And, and um, I'm going to attempt to show how these objects um, appear in these different registers for different people in, in this text. But really importantly, um, because it is properly a lost object, the appearance of an objet art um, is signaled by anxiety. So although we are propelled into life through losing the object, and that's quite proper, um, we should be continually searching for these objects. And if we um, find them, they tend to cause us um, anxiety. So there's a lot of anxiety around this mirror, and I'm going to theorize that it's because the objets are, are, have not been properly castrated, cut away from this family, uh, and they appear in association with this mirror as um, a libidinal father in the real object. Okay, so I'm going to explore uh, how these manifest. So, and I'm not going to go, it, it, it's, it's um, I'm going to focus more on uh, more time on the gaze. So I'm just going to go through the oral anal and the, the, the voice as objects reasonably, reasonably quickly. 
So first of all, Cindy's eldest daughter. The mirror is an oral object for Cindy's eldest daughter. She experiences bites to her neck as she combs her hair in the mirror. Hence, there is a metonymic association, a sliding association from the mirror to Uncle Bob, to Bella Lugosi, to Count Dracula, one of Bella Lugosi's most famous roles. So it might be suggested that Cindy's eldest daughter experiences the mirror as an oral object in the real, as a terrifying hallucination. And Lacan tells us that what is foreclosed from the symbolic returns in the real. And Cindy's eldest daughter is not embedded in the symbolic in this show. She's not named, she's just Cindy's eldest daughter and she doesn't speak. She's, she doesn't turn up to the show. She's talked about and she is unnamed. Next slide. So for Zach, the host, Zach also leverages the oral potential of the mirror to build his exposition of its paranormal powers. Specifically, he speculates about the ability of the mirror to consume, and that's a quote. He talks about the mirror consuming, and that's obviously an oral activity. He talks about the mirror consuming aspects of what is reflected in it. He says, did that mirror capture the killer's energy, that killer's soul, possibly your uncle? And he asks of it, what is inside of you? So very oral object here. And in this Sachs orientation towards the mirror, um, suggests that he experiences it as an oral object in the imaginary. That is as encapsulating an image of the rival or the little other, the counterpart who is ambiguously close and really importantly here, persecutory. And he uses this to build a picture of the mirror as a desiring object, so the, as um, itself as an objet art, a desiring object. Just wanted to, we're going on to Cindy and I just want to show you here, here is Zach uh, and here is Cindy. And this isn't um, a poor kind of slide, this this bit in the middle with the white out I think is quite important in terms of the gaze. Just have a think about that in terms of this, uh, not quite being able to see clearly. I think this is um, kind of deliberate. So Cindy is the mother and I think the mirror is an anal object for the mother Cindy. It is an unwanted gift representing in physical form trauma inherited through the paternal line. And she states, um, this is a quote, this item has caused my family so much anguish that I no longer feel safe with it. So if that's not a manifestation of, a, of anxiety around an object, which might be associated with it manifesting an objet art, I don't know, it's, uh, it seems really clear. It's a really nice example. Understandably, she wants to be rid of this anal object and she articulates, I think, perfectly the psychological dilemma presented. She says, I can't sell it, I can't give it, but if it kind of gets left behind, leaves it there, I think that's lovely. Hence she conveys the felt sense that this anal object is stuck to her in a way that cannot be passed on to someone else in a deliberate act. While the killer remains unidentified, she can regain a proper distance from the unassimilable real of the family trauma, only through a reenactment of symbolic castration in which the object is lost. I think this is a beautiful, I was looking for examples of, of um, psychoanalytically naive subjects just really talking about um, um, Lacanian, using Lacanian concepts. So for Zach, the host, I think um, Zach also sees the kind of experiences the mirror as an anal object, but in a different way. The intangible objet art of the anal drive is the gift. 
And hence the mirror is an anal object also for Zach in that he is willing to receive it for his museum collection. Just a true gift. <laughs> uh, in fact, he says of the mirror, quote, this may be my favourite possession to date. And he says, I believe this mirror to be the most dangerous possession I own. So it's quite a different orientation to the, the anal object. So I'm suggesting for Zach, the mirror is an anal object in the symbolic, and the symbolic is probably the least anxiety-provoking register in which to um, experience the objet art. Because for him, it is a powerful, alluring and charismatic item that will belong to him. But as we know with the, um, when we, we appear to, to, to get the object with the, um, this alluring power, it often be, you know, turns to dust. The, the, the allure of it disappears quite quickly because the objet art is um is 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 not actually there it's it's what we what we impute to the object what we project into the object and then we lose it again it it um it uh, metonymically um goes from object to object to object quite properly for us to keep pursuing um uh, you know, to to pursue uh to keep engaging with life and to 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 pursue um, meaning and things that, that that we want in life. So I'm um, I'm going to leave the object um, the gaze because I want to finish on on the gaze because it's a little bit more complicated. So I'm just going to touch on the object voice and the object voice to me is is a particularly mysterious object. R. Um. And it's only in Zach's possession, and I think this is quite interesting, that um, the mirror manifests um, as the object voice. And Miller clarifies for us that um, the object voice is everything in the signifier that does not partake of the effect of signification. So it is um, noises, it is, can be spoken, um, but often noises or the, the, the spoken word, which is assigned to the big other, to something beyond. Um, and like all forms of objet art, does have a libidinal charge. It's not any old voice. It has to be something which um, has got some kind of um, uh, resonance, that personal has some kind of personal resonance, some kind of libidinal charge for us. Um, and to explain this a little bit more, if you, if I just want, um, to, if you go to the next slide, um, this is Zach's colleague, Aaron, uh, who has been forced <laughs> into the isolation chamber to stare into the mirror in the scrying uh, experiment. And this is him looking into the mirror, looking to see what it will manifest. Um, and I think the voice manifests for Aaron um, when he hears noises in the isolation room during the scrying experiment, he says, there's a weird feeling in here, guys. I heard something right here, just like a scuffle. And he takes this as a sign of presence. And I think this scuffle noise is probably a manifestation of the objet art um, in, in the form of the voice. And I think for the voice manifests for Zach also when during his filming of the basement flood, that he draws attention to noises that he says he doesn't, he can't account for, for these noises. Um, and he attributes it to having the, the, the mirror in his possession. And the mirror has somehow been um, responsible for the flood in the basement. And I think in both these instances, the object voice appears to manifest in the imaginary register because both Aaron and Zach make use of objectively audible noises uh, in order to create a fantastic image of the mirror's persecutory power. So the final object um, that we're going to cover then is the manifestation um, of the objet as um, so the objet as the gaze. Of all the modes of the objet, 
The object gaze of the scopic drive is the most prominent in the material analysed. And I don't, and I th think this is um, not a coincidence. I think um, it's something that might be quite characteristic of paranormal programming. And it's something I'd be really interested to, to explore further. And I found a, a PhD uh, thesis by Chabot, uh, published 2000, and, or, uh, well, available in 2019, where he's looking at um, paranormal programming. Um, and he refers to contemporary burgeoning of paranormal investigative media as an epistoph epistophilic drive. Um, and it is a, a drive in the register of seeing specifically. And I quote, he says, a desire to visualize the imperceptible. And I think that's really nice about what, why we might watch um, something like paranormal programming is really popular. And in my own words, I'm going to translate this to, um, I think there is a desire to know through the desire to see in a terrain where typically it may be difficult to believe one's eyes. And I think that captures for me anyway, one of the, the uh, things I really like about why I watch paranormal programming. So, so in terms of Cindy's eldest daughter, I think she experiences the object gaze in the imaginary. So Cindy's oldest daughter is troubled by the object gaze in the imaginary. In the imaginary, the objet art is experienced as the persecutory petty tort of the mirror image, the little other in the mirror image. And we are told that Cindy's older daughter um, says, apparently she said to her, 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 um, her mother that a figure would come through the mirror and attack her. And as an objet art, this figure is never fully discernible and manifests predominantly as part objects, particularly part objects of the body. And we're just told that she describes a hand reaching out of the mirror into you, in, in, um, towards her. And Cindy also reports how her older daughter continued to be persecuted by the object gaze in the imaginary. Um, she started to second guess things where you think you see things. Um, and I don't think this seems to be describing a, a more kind of hallucinatory experience um, in the real. I think it, it seems to be an, an experience of the objet uh, as gaze in the imaginary. That experience where you catch something out of uh, you know, a glimpse of something out of the corner of your eye that shouldn't be there and I think that's um, a more kind of everyday experience of uh, the gaze um, object gaze in, in the imaginary and um, Irene here's a here's a still of uh, Irene who's the younger daughter so Irene too experiences the object gaze in the imaginary while sleeping unbeknownst to her in a room where the Bella Lugosi mirror was in the corner, Irene tells us that she had a dream of aggressive part objects. She says, I just remember the vision of hands and this very dark face. And this attack manifests also in the imaginary with Irene's discovery of scratches on her body when she woke up. And um, the body, uh, the image of the body is very much in the imaginary register. So I'm coming to a, a close now on, on my analysis. Let's check the time. Okay, we're doing okay. Um, so I'm now going to look at um, what I find one of the most fascinating aspects is the way that the host, Zach, accounts for the uncanny of this object through invoking the objet art, but also how the show itself creates an un canny effect and that both of these are done through um, the objects um, and I'm going to focus on the object gaze. So in terms of accounting for the uncanny, um, in terms of accounting for the phenomena described by Cindy and Irene, Zach connects the mirror with the object gaze in the imaginary that there's something uncanny in it that he might be able to see. And he's filmed looking into the mirror, 
seeking the object gaze and expecting it to be of a human figure or the petit autre. He says, um, as he's looking into the mirror, I just look in here trying to see if someone will appear behind me. So this is uh, looking for the little other, the, the counterpart in the mirror, so in the, the imagine, in the imaginary. The show itself creates an uncanny effect, uh, uncanny effect. Um, and I think it does, through, does so through invoking, creating a sense in the audience of the real object gaze. And this is a still from the programme of Zach looking directly into the camera, but it's done in terms of we are, we, it is him looking directly into the mirror. So the object gaze in the real is the point from which one is looked at, but from where exactly one can never see. And that this looking is assigned to the big other rather than the, the little other. So it's to some symbolic authority, something in you know, kind of non-subjective uh, in, in, in the symbolic rather than being looked at by another subjective little other person and a rival or a counterpart. Um, and it gives the effect, this uncanny effect, the, the real gaze gives the uncanny effect um, of it makes us very aware that one is oneself visible. And in the sequence in which Zach contemplates the mirror on his own, a particularly disturbing effect is achieved. Zach is filmed looking searchingly, almost directly into the camera, giving the impression that he is scanning the mirror's reflective surface. However, in the moments Zach looks into the camera, the real object gaze is installed for the viewer in two places at once. First, Zach is the gaze as he stares blindly out at the viewer seemingly into the mirror. That is, Zach breaks the fourth wall, transforming the viewer's safe position as the watcher to that in which their own presence is being searched out visually from the impossible place within side the television. But also second, the viewer is also the real gaze as they watch Zach seeing them uh, watch Zach, no, sorry, as they watch Zach seemingly from the impossible specular place within the mirror that Zach cannot see. Hence the content and form of the sequence studied are mutually sustaining in terms of accounting for and creating a reality of the mirror as a haunted object in the mode of the gaze. And just in the next slide, I'm almost finished, but just in the next slide, um, this is a particularly interesting um, sequence where I've just got a still of Zach turns away from the mirror and walks off. Um, and it's not clear actually, but you know, where we're looking at Zach, and this helps kind of install this very uncanny effect, um, is Zach being filmed behind the mirror? Are we, be, are we as the audience behind the mirror watching Zach as he walks away? Are we being positioned within the mirror watching Zach as he walks away? This is us as, as the gaze. It's, um, but there's another position. Are we behind Zach watching him in the mirror as he walks away? And is he in the mirror as a mere reflection? Or is he in the mirror only? Is he just in the mirror as, as the gaze? Um, and this kind of this image just struck me is where where is the mirror here and where are we positioned? It's really, really ambiguated and creates a very uncanny effect. So in the next next slide, just to finish off. Um, just to summarise that um, if we have a table of the different personages here and where the um, objet art seems to be experienced for these people in this text, um, we see, I think, the, the, the real 
objaya or experiencing the objaya in the real is the most traumatic place. It is unassimilable. It is incredibly frightening. And we have Cindy and her eldest daughter have that kind of experience. Um, and then we have the Irene's, the, the younger daughter, um, experiences it more in the imaginary. And I think we have a sense of Irene being able to kind of cope with the family method to a certain level, that she does experience the objet around this libidinal um, uh, object, and it is frightening, but it, it, she's kind of managing this more in, in, in the imaginary. Um, and Zach in the kind of mainly again experiences the objet art in the imaginary, but it all, he is the only one who also experiences it in the least problematic place, I think, in terms of the symbolic as this precious charismatic object. And then the analysis suggests that we as the audience are then provoked by the program itself to experience the real gaze and that this is, is really quite skillfully done in this piece of genre programming. I think it's really done nicely. So my final slide, just to, to sum up um, in terms of my aims. So, and I just do want to, to read, read, read out a little bit. I won't take too long, but I want to make sure that I really close this um, properly. So the first aim was to provide an example of the spontaneous deployment of Lacanian theory by naive narrators in their rendition of some disturbing experiences. It's argued, and I hopefully it's been demonstrated, that phenomena related to Lacan's theory of the objet art, amongst others, are paralleled in the mundane sense-making practices in the examined text, which attempts to express and explain the felt sense or lived reality of trauma. The mirror as objet art must be lost, it must be cut from the imaginary body of the family. Only then, whilst the killer remains unnamed, can Cindy and her daughters normalize the family symbolic disrupted by the horrific murder of Uncle Bob. And then second aim was to explore the applicability of Lacanian theory for understanding experiences of the paranormal while not seeking to explain them away. And I think here it's useful to reflect on Lacan's aphorism that every truth has the structure of a fiction, that is that reality itself is phantasmatic. However, in not wanting to psychologize the way paranormal phenomena, um, it's useful to, to turn to Johnson's suggestion, kind of suggested reversal, that fiction may have the same structure of, of a truth. That is, that the truth of desire is embedded in the stories that we tell ourselves and others, whether or not um, the artifice, artifice is deliberate, so that even if this program itself is, is edited, it's artificial, it's designed for a certain um, audience and to have a certain effect, um, the, the, the truth of desire may still be held. So I want to just end on my conclusion statement that perhaps from a Lacanian perspective, a key value of stories of the paranormal is not in how closely they correspond to the facts, but what they reveal about the workings of desire. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Um, that was fascinating and very engaging. Um, as usual, I'm going to start off um, asking Anna some questions, but if the audience have questions, please stick up your um, your Zoom hand and we'll unmute you or give you the power to unmute yourself um, and you can join in the conversation. Um, so I've got a ton of questions I want to ask you, Anna, ranging from um, about you to uh, about where mm -hmm. this is coming from to um, your use of Lacan. Um, I won't start with you. I'll start with Lacan. It's maybe um, slightly fairer. I was really interested in, in the way you, you've you've chosen to talk about a mirror, and the mirror is 
you know, very obviously um, resonant of Lacan for people who know very little about Lacan. Mirror stage is probably the one bit of Lacan that they have some kind of purchase on. And yet, for most of your talk, you're talking about a mirror as an object rather than a mirror as a mirror, which is is a really interesting way to approach it. So the mirror becomes something, it's almost accidentally a mirror. It, it doesn't need to be a mirror. It's, it's a, a thing from a house. Um, and it's only really towards the end when we get to the elder sister and, and to Zach that the mirror starts to, to function as a mirror. Um, so I just wonder if you wanted to unpack that a little bit more mm -hmm. was that significant in your in your choice because you've you've chosen this particular um segment of a program out of um you know many many more programs you you could have selected w was your choice motivated by the, the mirror and the non mirrorness of the mirror i do have a a pretty short section about the the mirror stage in in the fuller piece um but more in terms of um the idea of, of the um the, the the mirror stage being where the ego becomes uh instantiated for for, for the subject um so that it, it's the beginning kind of, of of a coming into the symbolic and having a um having a you know a sense of kind of this this central sense of self um and i think for this family um th there is a frac there the, the myth seems to be about lack of a paternal function that there's not been um that the in installation of um a, a strong sense of self for for maybe people in this family um, being having jouissance um, restricted, having a strong sense of bodily integrity, a strong sense of who they are. That, that this is quite tenuous um, in, in, in the myth making of this family. And I have to be very careful, I'm not pathologizing this family, saying in the story that they present, this seems to come across. It comes across very nicely in, um, particularly with the eldest daughter, that she has, when, she, when she's in front of the mirror, she has experiences of body parts coming at her. So we know with um, the mirror stage that it's about um, helping the individual create uh, an, an e install an ego from the outside that gives them a sense of bodily integrity and, and a sense of kind of, um, of of self and we see this fracturing in a lot of these these objects are just kind of come come streaming out um so it, it does kind of function a little bit like this but i think you're right it's more that it, it is just a, it, it's a, an object that has um Kind of captured this this libidinal myth for the family and i'm very kind of interested with um this program there's lots of other objects obviously that are brought that are haunted that i'm going to do some analysis of so i think it does leverage a little bit of, of the mirror stage but i think you're right that became much less important than it being um an, a, a libidinal object in its own right mm. Yeah, and I mean, it's me when you're, you you were expanding that point there. One of the other points that Lacan makes in the Mirror Stage essay, and in a number of his other essays around that period of time, is around the idea of paranoia. And you know, Lacan's at the point of yeah. developing the Mirror Stage idea. You know, he's mm -hmm. coming out of written his thesis. Um, very much focused on the idea of paranoia and the mirror stage and um, the aggressivity essay in particular, he makes this point about this, the paranoid structure of reality. And that seems to be um, something that is, that we can, we can read into, or we can see evidenced in, in this story that the, the mirror is there, the objects, let's say the, the object, which happens to be a mirror functions in this way that's, um, that props up a, a paranoid, um, yes, a, a paranoid experience of reality, um, and I wonder—is that something I'm not terribly well versed in in paranormal TV? It's not 
not one of my pastimes. Is that something you see more generally in in pe- this kind of public fascination with the paranormal? Mm-hmm. Mm. Um, what what I think has come out to be a little bit more clearly in in doing some of this analysis is um, how the the these programs may make use of um, making us fearful, uh, so they kind of capture our interest. Um, you know, kind of become libidinized objects because they present us with frightening experiences in, in a relatively safe way. So I think, um, and they, they present us with people who have par- you know, kind of like scary experiences, which you might see as kind of quite quite paranoid experiences. So I think I think you're right. Um, and I didn't go into it, but it, um, in this presentation, but in my in my piece, I look at the different fundamental fantasies and how the people uh, in this short program um, present different forms of fundamental um, fantasies. And one of them is the perverse fundamental fantasy. And it's quite striking. I never I didn't anticipate this, but that these programs themselves may be presenting us with the perverse fundamental fantasy, that they they present themselves as, as the objet are, the frightening object to us. <laughs> uh, and that and the perverse fundamental fantasy is of being the um the objet are of the anxiety provoking object, which then speaks to the unconscious of the subjects in, in the world. Um, and frightens them, um, and I think the, this, these programs may actually uh, have co- have a structure of a perverse fantasy, um, which I hadn't expected at all. But I think maybe that speaks to the point of um, you know slightly uh, rather than paranoia, um, it maybe speaks to these programs themselves creating themselves as perverse fantasy objets to their audience and this is done in this program in terms of um, giving us the uncanny experience of the the program itself being the gaze and, uh, I mean, having seen little bits of the these programs it's not it's not something i'm terribly immersed in they've never struck me as particularly frightening and is that because i don't watch them enough or you know or is it the case the it's almost a a playing with with the idea of frightening rather than being truly frightening and and in that sense it's you know almost like freud's fork da where it's kind of it dangles frightening and removes frightening so it's a it's a safe experience of it, it is I think it does, it, 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 and I think people can watch it because you know, like we watch horror films in terms of we, we watch what we can deal with, or we challenge ourselves to you know kind of like what kind of horror can I deal with and where do I need to actually <laughs> switch it off? I'm not going to watch it, and I know that you know I've got what, what I can watch and what I can't. Um, so it kind of comes back to th- these these this type of programming obviously just doesn't capture something for you. These are not the bit of all programs for you whereas many of them have been for me but I do actually see less so is I'm less engaged by them I'm less entertained by them um and I've been through that 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 kind of span of actually you know years and years ago finding them not frightening but finding them a little frightening uh to actually not finding them frightening at all now. So I think there's a transformative aspect which we do have with the, with the kind of our engagement with objet art, isn't it? Is that um, it depends where we are and who we are, um, what point we are in our lives, where, where we're caught, where certain objects, like a program as an object, um, helps manifest the objet art for us. Because it's not in the object, is it? It's in us. <laughs> mm. And if it's not capturing, loads of things will capture me libidinously that won't capture you. You know, it's, uh, and that's kind of the beauty for it. You're not the audience for this, obviously. It's not, not doing anything for you. Um, I have been the audience to this, and now maybe I'm a slightly more cynical <laughs> audience member. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I, I think you're right. I'm not, but I wasn't trying to take a position on that so much as excuse my own ignorance. Um, but it, it strikes me that there's a, a difference between this kind of reality TV um, immersion in or 
um, experience of the paranormal, which is presenting an experience of the paranormal, and your classic horror film, which mm. in in the examples you're you're using here, you're you're allowed this vicarious experience, which allows you to take something like an ironic distance from from what's going on. Whereas with the you know, your classic horror film, if you choose to watch it, you're very much you're, you're putting yourself you know in the center yes. seat, and it's you know yes. you're immersing yourself in the experience much more fully. And um, there's a curious um, a, a curious desire at work here, then, isn't there? To to experience something without experience. But I, but I think maybe the, the key difference is that this the paranormal programming tends to um, they, well, always be, presents itself as the truth. Whereas when we watch a horror film, we know it's fiction. <laughs> so I think a, a particularly intriguing uh, aspect of the, of the paranormal programming is where it plays in this space between truth and fiction and the extent to which we are pulled in as is this could this possibly be true to no no no, no it's just theater or um do they are they making this up or are, are they interpreting something in, in in a way that they really believe and i think it plays in this um in a really nice way that that the horror film doesn't you, you you agree to to enter the frame of the horror film and, and you, you kind of go with it whereas here there's a, i think that that quote about it being a, an epistophilic drive the wanting to know through wanting to see and then we've got film we've got recordings we've got your know, things captured on uh, and i think that's where i'm i find it very intriguing in terms of where i'm going to believe and where i'm not um, and and that's i think why i'm particularly interested and i wanted to use lacanian concepts because i think i found like a way out of that dilemma what's true and what's not and that psychoanalysis gives me a position that says i don't have to make a decision about what's true <laughs> no kind of what what's veracity and and, and and what's made up um because the the truth of desire may be in there whatever and the truth of wanting you know the the desire to present something to engage an audience in a particular way tells us something and tells us something about the desire of the film of the program makers maybe but more about the desire of the audience that they're presenting an object are to fulfill a space of desire and I think that that's quite a relief to me <laughs> I, I feel very naive that I've been kind of like what's true and what's not and I go I can actually just sidestep that question through psychoanalysis but in a really meaningful way that I feel um quite, quite you know, satisfying yeah no I, I think you're right and I think that's a very a very important point about Lacan in particular and I'm not sure all forms of psychoanalysis would embrace that right. particular point. I think there is something quite precise in Lacan's theory that Lacan's work as a whole is is a form of epistemology. It's, it's about it's a theory of knowing that, as you say, mm. allows us to to position truth in a very particular way, rather than have to make that you know. That choice, that that choice about veracity, you know, is this real? You know, you know, as we know, Lacan's idea of real pushes that to the side completely. So I think that's a really yeah. important yeah. point. Yeah. I'm going to stop hogging you. I see um, Ollie's got his hand up, so I'm going to pass over to Ollie. Um, Ollie. Hi, Anna. Um, hello. Hello. I wanted to ask you a little bit about um, last in relation to, to the family. And it sounded to me as you were describing their experiences that there was something really functional for this family in terms of this, this shared myth that allowed them to have some kind of joint meaning in terms of their experiences. So I wondered where, where did you locate the lack in either in the individual subjects or collectively for the family? And did you think that it was it, it did have a function for them, either in terms of kind of unifying them as a family 
or was it that that was able to perpetuate their desire that there was this this joint sense of of lack in in some way so I have to be very careful to say that, you know, I'm not psychoanalyzing this family <laughs> and uh, I, I'm taking and I think you understand that and I'm taking the program as the narrative, uh, as what I'm actually in investigating and, 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 and what, what the narrative of it of it is and not kind of seeking out, out outside of that. Um, but it does seem that the family in their in their story um, lack of paternal function, um, that they lack a strong father in the symbolic or symbolic Oedipal castrating father. And, and this seems to be evident in the amount of kind of um, jouissance dotting about all over the place that's not been um, kind of held in check for, for, for the women of this family as they describe the um, experiences uh, around around the mirror um and i think that that point that the murder of the uncle who is obviously on, on the paternal line has not been solved kind of suggested that there is a symbolic debt you know kind of the, 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 due this this family that the law in its literal form has not fulfilled its function. Um, the the murder has gone unsolved. It's gone. Um, uh, you know, nobody has paid for for, for this. So um, I think yet yeah, that the mirror functions in terms of probably condensing all that into an object that then the, the family can have the experiences around this object, possibly rather than particularly pursuing any kind of action in, in the real world or trying to, you know, they, they can't solve this. You know, this is this is this is not 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 something, you know, they can't solve the, this this murder. But I think um the giving the item to to the museum is fulfilling, I think, a really important function for this family. That and, and that the mother is just, I think, incredibly insightful in terms of how this, how she experiences it, is that it's not something that can be given. You can't give this kind of libidinal object to other people to get rid of it because the debt is still kind of held to it. Um, uh, but you can lose it. You can leave it behind. Um, and and this is almost like, as I said at the end, there's a. Um, that, that, that Cindy, the mother herself, is fulfilling a paternal function by castrating the family um, quite properly, getting rid of this symbolic, this debt, um, and getting rid of this jouissance object. So I, I would hope that, um, that, that, that the family um, come, have a more solid footing in, in the symbolic uh, more normal functioning, um, mm -hmm. having got rid of this object, and it, so yeah, uh, d d does that kind of address your? No, very, question? yeah, very, very much so. I was just, I was wondering as you were speaking, was there a part of any of the individuals that they posited as lost, and was it that that was generative of of their desire? So I, I, I think that you're saying there that it's, it's because they have this unfulfilled. Or unsatisfied paternal function in in their structure is what that it, it's that that's therefore generative of their desire. If I'm understanding you correctly, um, in a way, you might say that their desire is stuck because they've not lost this object. That they, they've not that the family that, that the family have not properly experienced castration. So um, to, to properly function in the symbolic means to be properly castrated, to, to properly lose one's object so that you go and look for it and you're propelled, driven through life to develop your own uh, meaning and, and your own path through looking, through looking, through looking for this lost object. And I think possibly desire has been stopped for this family because they because the object's there, the object's in front of them, the object's causing all this trauma. Um, so it's I think it's maybe the opposite that they need to lose this in order to then go on and desire 
properly within the symbolic and move on with their lives. Okay. Okay. Right. Thank you. And as apologize if I missed this, but just going back to the story of the the film, is there a is there a trajectory of experience of the mirror in this kind of collective um this assumption of the mirror as a collective object is, mm -hmm. is how you, you you're presenting it um did it start with one of them and was it contagious or did it start spontaneously with all of them or is is that not there <laughs> Okay, so, so the, the story um, in the program is that the eldest daughter takes the mirror with her when she leaves home. So this is kind of a crisis point of uh, for, for any young woman or any person you're kind of leaving the family home. They're going out to you know, kind of pursue their own path in life. And she takes this mirror with her. And that's when these um, kind of really quite traumatic experiences happened to her in front of the mirror and she she returns home so it seems that that's the starting point in the story they tell us and then once that's been triggered when the older daughter comes back then Irene the younger daughter starts to have maybe slightly less traumatic experiences but she starts to experience it um so what what i say in in the, the piece a little bit more widely kind of is to say that um cindy's two daughters seem to be finding it difficult to find a strong foothold in the symbolic they seem to be leaving home having trouble coming back returning to the mother's house having some traumatic experiences they're finding it difficult to really move on and find a very secure footing as independent young women you know out there striving and searching for their own objects so so prior to leaving home the mirror had just been a mirror they hadn't they hadn't experienced it as anything paranormal within the story but um and that's what i'm analyzing so there may have been other things that they didn't tell us in this 27 minute clip um but yes what what, what we hear in the clip is it starts with the oldest daughter leaving home and taking the mirror with her okay. and is there a sense that they are they're frightened by what they experience or yes. no? very much so very much so. Less so Cindy. Um, Cindy seems to be, you know, trying to protect her daughters. So her daughters are having, particularly the eldest daughter is having what appear to be um, kind of hallucinatory experiences around. But I don't want to psychologize too much, but it's like she experiences real phenomena, you know, phenomena in, in the real. Whereas um, Irene appears to experience it in, in the imaginary, which is more easy, is more easy to cope with, but still anxiety provoking, but but less so. She dream has difficult dreams when when the mirror is in the room. So that's easier. I th used to say, but she doesn't seem so traumatized, and she does talk about um, kind of being a little bit on kind of she she's. She's coping. She says, I'm a little more scientific about it. Who knows what's going on? So she's got a narrative about it. She's buying into the family myth, as is the mother. But the eldest daughter isn't there. We're told she's very traumatized. There's a sense that she's not able to, to, to even symbolize what's going on with the mirror in terms of a myth, whereas Cindy and Irene are doing that. And I think that that's very helpful. And it seems that Cindy's not had these experiences, but she's trying to protect, she believes her daughters and she's trying to protect them. And she does have a narrative of, of the myth yeah. around the, the mirror. Fascinating. Um, I want to ask you, moving slightly on from that, the particular analysis, that particular clip, I'm curious about, as I kind of indicated at the very beginning, this you know, idea that you're not, um, you know, you've not come through um, Lacanian training and, you know, it, it's not your trajectory. You've come to, you, know, you were already working in academia and, and came to Lacan. Um, and you work in a psychology department, so yes, yes. So, as 
I'm, I'm curious about this. That what brings a psychologist to the Khan? <laughs> um, well, I'm not a very traditional psychologist. My, my PhD was using uh, discourse analysis. Um, to look at change processes and psychotherapy, so I, mean, I have been kind of involved on on the on the kind of sidelines of clinical practice, and I did think that I would train as a clinician, um, but then I kind of got a job in academia and really enjoyed it. Um, I have been through a five year uh, analysis with <laughs> a Freudian Lacanian, um, so I, I have been very interested to uh, kind of use um, your psychoanal psychoanalysis to understand and I find it incredibly intriguing and, and particularly Lacan that I've always been very, I'm a qualitative um, psychologist very in interested in discourse done some training in conversation analysis so I'm really um, you know very much in how we use language to create reality and to 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 um you know construct our, our experiences through language and our self-understanding being framed by language so of course then that brings me into um that the can is uh, you know kind of very very focused on on language um and i just find it it's so helpful um and just incredibly intriguing i just you know kind of um really want to kind of to understand and to be able to to use the concepts and find it, it, it very helpful personally and just find it for, for a text that I find really intriguing like I've been you know kind of here like um it just gives me such an opening into um when I say understanding what's going on I don't mean that in a closed sense I mean it in an opening up of understanding hmm. um, not in a giving a final version of it but in terms of a way in that that gives me kind of a map of of, of, of the terrain that I can start to kind of have little steps in and um, I just find it really exciting, sadly exciting as it were, um, I, and I really want to understand more and I want to really understand. <laughs> and that, that's where it kind of comes in as a, as a um, being an academic, is I really, really want to get some kind of hold on these um, aspects of life that that just intrigue me. And a lot of those things that intrigue me are the things that I, I you know, kind of do in, you know, that I find in my, you know, outside of academia, the things I engage with, like what I watch on TV. And then I'm just thinking, you know, how can I make sense of this? Because I find it so intriguing and I am so curious. Yeah, curiosity is a, a fantastic thing. Um, uh, pushing this a little further, can you, as, I mean, I mean, I, I'm going to preface this with a, a caveat. I don't think people are their their disciplines. So when I say as a psychologist, I'm not trying to suggest that you are somehow, you know, to the core, you're a psychologist and that, you know, that's the reality of your existence. But as someone who has been, who's worked within a psychology department, who's studied within a psychology department and never you know, been um in that ambience of of psychology and psychology's way of talking about things, which I think when you're in that ambience, which in some ways we all are, because I I think psychology is uh, is rife. It's it's everywhere. It's you know it's spilled out of our TVs and the, the cinema and you know, the government. Everything yeah. is it's is like contained by yeah. by psychology. How easy is it to to bring Lacan into that without Lacan becomes becoming or Lacan's theory becomes becoming something other. And you made the point a number of times, both in your talk and in in the discussion, that you didn't want to psychologize mm -hmm. the the people in the in the film, the characters in the film. And this isn't an accusation. It, it's it's a genuine question. It, it strikes me that's a very difficult thing to do to yeah, to not yeah, yeah. psychologize 
yeah. when we take Lacan out of the out of the clinic, out of the Lacanian clinic, where it's you know arguably, yeah, and there are people who argue that's its only place is in the within the clinic. I would say no myself. I think it has a lot of potential to um, to help us understand the world and people in the world. But that that danger, which yeah, how, how do we resist that that slide? I, I was going to say temptation, but it's, it's even more than a temptation that we find ourselves as we talk sliding into psychologization. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so, and I realise there. I keep saying I don't want to pathologise this family. Um, I, feel, I still think it's important to say that that that, that you don't, that I don't want to patho um, kind of psychologise, and, and I'm not analysing this family and. Um, uh, um, even though it slides that way, I still think there's there's some currency to say that I don't mean it to slide slide that way, and I need to be very careful. And some of the problems in doing that is, you know, obviously I, I don't know this family, and I, I, I don't even know anything about them, and um, uh, beyond what they've said in in the text, um, I'm analysing the text. And I have to be uh, as, as a thing. Um, as a self-contained thing, um, and I think that um, I mean, but, but when I was, when I'm, I mean, I'm trying, I'm still trying to find my my position in doing this, and it's almost like taking. Is is it a little bit like taking this as a dream text? Is it? Um, I, mean, I know you have to be careful when, you, when you're analysing dreams. You, you know, it's the person who dreams it needs to do the the association. So maybe it it, it it's not like dream, uh, analyzing a dream text. But I suppose what happens is, with, um, in a sense, I'm the I, I'm kind of searching if it maybe I'm the dreamer because I'm an audience member. Hmm. So this this text is presented to me, um, and maybe I could. It, it's like. Um, it's like what we talked about. It, it, it's a libidinized text for me in certain ways because it appeals to me and it resonates with me. And I find it, uh, it makes me very curious about it. And there's a lot of stuff out there that, you know, kind of on telly that I'm not particularly curious about that somebody else might be very curious about and do an analysis of. So I'm, I'm kind of in here as well. Um, but I, I, I have found Lacanian concepts, particularly here of the, the objet are really useful uh, in terms of understanding this programming and, and why it really fascinates, why this, this section it really, really fascinates me. And I think all six episodes um, are, are really, really um, exciting. Um, and I think maybe one, the aim that I had about wanting to understand if these Lacanian concepts do tell us something about how people function. Um, we should be able to see them functioning outside the clinic, I think. There's no reason to believe that they just function in the clinic. Um, and I think maybe that's a huge motivation for me as a non-clinician is, you know, outside of analysis, I want to go, where are these things just in my life, you know, kind of just in my everyday ordinary life. And and where are these in other people's ordinary everyday life? And, and how do they function where they're not possibly highly pathological or blah, blah, blah. Um, I, I think I can, you know, that, that's what I want to understand. But I, I don't know if that's kind of, I don't know if I've kind of answered your question at all, but I've kind of talked around it. Rather. No, absolutely. It's, um... I'm just asking from curiosity. Um, but yeah, no, I think you're absolutely right. If Lacan's got something important to say about about what it means to be a human being or how we understand yeah. our existence as human beings, then yeah, I mean that that has to be meaningful beyond, you know, a closed room with with two people or one person and one imaginary person. Yes. So yeah, I'm with you on that. <laughs> But, but but it's um, a, a big question about the, the methodology, and I am kind of a, a, a methodologist. Is, is one of my kind of main things as an academic, um, and I know that there, there's you know, a variety of writing about using the Kenyan 
and other psychoanalytic concepts outside the clinic. Um, and, and there's a variety of different approaches to that. But it's not been well worked out and there's a lot of problems doing it. So it's something that I'd like to, you know, for myself, explore a lot more about taking intriguing texts that I can, I, I can use Lacanian concepts to help me understand and to work from that to figure out what is a legitimate method for doing this? Just you know, a legitimate me method for getting somewhere with it. And what are the drawbacks of that method? What are the limits of that method? And where, where do we have to be really careful not to overstep the mark and make claims that we can't make? Um, but I think we can make some legitimate claims and we can do some interesting, um, useful helpful analysis and, and that, that's where I where I probably place myself. I'd like to to figure that out for myself and write about it and maybe open up a bit of a space, a little bit of using Lacanian analysis outside the clinic to to look at these kinds of texts. I think that's I think you make a very good point there. I think a lot of people who use Lacan to do something other than psychoanalysis don't foreground their methodology or yeah. don't disclose their methodology, possibly don't even think about their methodology. So, I, mean, I was, I always said don't have a methodology, but I think there's probably always a methodology there, but it's, it's bringing it out and um, you know, being rigorous and being consistent in, in that. And I think something that doesn't always happen um, or isn't always obvious in, in the text. Yeah. Um, and I think to go back to that question, just just you asked about you know being being a psychologist. Um, psychology is very uh, interested in methodology. <laughs> um, we are we as a discipline, we're very about doing method, and our students all get you know statistics, and they all get their labs, and they all have to write their lab reports and everything. Um, and I think that is a good discipline, um, and I think it is something that I've learned through being an academic psychologist is to really be thinking about methodology and to be articulating um, about methodology and to be thinking about the limits of it. Um, uh, and, and I think that is something that, that we can offer. Um, but no, I, I teach a little bit of Freud. I, I teach a module um, or half a module in psychological disorders. So I do do that, but no, uh, Callum, there's, there's no space. <laughs> I did offer a fine. I was asked if I would do a final year module like recently, and I said, "Oh, I could do one on the core." And, it, and it, I don't think it would be very popular. So I think I've got out of that. Um, maybe a good thing to duck, but I would disagree with them. I think it'd be very popular. Um, I used to teach Lacan to psychologists, and oh, right. s some of them liked it. Um, it was seemed to be very yeah. popular with the curious and. Um, yeah. Not so popular are those who are just kind of trying to to get their way through. Um, but, uh, okay, well, I hope my director of student education doesn't hear this. Then <laughs> he <laughs> might ask me to do it. <laughs> we can edit this bit out. Don't worry. Um, <laughs> um, Ollie, I saw you had your hand up there. So, um, did you have a? Yeah, sorry, I just I noticed somebody else had the hand up, and I'd already asked a question. So, I oh, like, sorry, I didn't um, see the other hand. Um, I felt a little guilty, but it's, it's just a really quick one. And it, it was just to ask you about the what you thought the function of the, the blot, the stain, the very clear um, in, instance, you know, the rem, reminiscent of uh, the, the Hans Holbein painting. Um, did, you know, did that work in terms of inciting your desire as, as a spectator or was it was it too was it too blatant the kind of the mis the mystique of it did it too deliberately draw you into the image so sorry so so, so this is I, I did draw attention to that blur in, in in the middle um yes i have a little bit of analysis of this in, in in the piece itself where um this looks a little bit like an eye particularly kind of an eye with cataract um and it um obscures the central part of the screen which is I suppose which does it incite your desire because you want to know well, what you know kind of what, if something obscures your vision it, um, it can incite your desire to see more because you're being obscured 
but only if you really want to see what's behind it already if if, if you've been um kind of it, it, the, the what you might want to see is libidinized you, you have a curiosity for it so i think this um is quite clever programming that there is a kind of eye throughout um, and it is um, a real gaze. So it is the um, the program itself as a kind of eye looking back at you as, as the viewer. Um, but it's an un, it's a blind eye, and it's an eye that obscures. So um, it's it kind of fulfills kind of the definition of of, of a real gaze. So I think it's part of that um, uh, kind of making the program itself into a, an object as the gaze. Thank you. Brilliant. Thanks, Ollie. Um, and thank you, Anna. We've got to um, 9.30, so um, we'll wrap things up there. But thank you for a fascinating talk and, um, and a, a really rich and varied um, discussion as well. I don't know about the rest of the audience, but I'm going to go and watch some paranormal TV now. <laughs> to find out what this is all about. Um, watch some more, Zach. <laughs> did it again? Watch some more Zach Bagans. Yes. <laughs> He's pretty good. I'll try it out. Um, but no, thank you very much, Anna. It's, it's been fantastic. Thank you.